excited to introduce you to Chai Mitzvah. Chai Mitzvah is a wonderful uh, program, which is, it's actually an engagement program. So we do some text-based discussions. We do some kind of social action. And we do some kind of, we call it the Jewish bucket list. Um, deepening a uh, spiritual practice that maybe you've always wanted to know more about, or maybe you've just wanted to increase in your life. The virtual class we're going to be doing tonight is um, one of our different high mitzvah curricula. It works the way all of ours do with some text study and some really wonderful conversations. And we're really lucky to have uh, Rabbi Nitzan Bergman tonight because he is actually the um, <laughs> author of this curriculum and you couldn't get a better teacher. So that introduction, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Um, Nina is the best. Um, Nina is actually, uh, besides a uh, fantastic educator, also a um, brilliant graphic designer. And when we look at the curriculum together, when we're going to work off a workbook, uh, we will all appreciate amazing work. Um, so just a little bit of, ba of background about me and um, what is there it's all about. Um, as you can hear, I was born in South Africa, but I have lived in other countries. Um, and about three years ago, I joined an organization which actually headquartered in Jerusalem called Project Aseret. And the idea of Project Aseret was really to start it off in Israel, but to try and influence Jewish identity around the core values of the Ten Commandments. That's, that's really what it's about. And um, it's been going for about 10 years now. And it's, in Israel, it really focuses at a school age, or about mitzvah age, B'nai mitzvah age. And um, I, over here, I'm, I'm based in Baltimore. And in the English-speaking world, um, we focus on a very wide, very wide range, um, anywhere from preschool to, here we are, the adult uh, course. So, um, I think, with no further ado, let's get going. You got any questions? Okay, so what I'm going to do is we're going to be working off um, let's share the right screen. Is my screen shared with you? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> and it says it's there at the Big Ten? Mm -hmm. That's yes. interesting. Normally it has a big green thing going around it. Okay, fine. So let's go here. Okay, fantastic. So let's start off. I think what we're going to do is um, this is the booklet um, that we're going to be working through. Sorry to go through, through so far fast. Um, there are 10 pages, 11 pages. And we're not going to look at everything, but um, we'll try and get through most of the material indefinitely. The idea is to have a discussion. This is a discussion group, and I'm the facilitator. I'm proud to be the facilitator. So um, please be um, proactive in asking questions, giving comments, whatever you'd like as we go through it. Um, okay. Let's go to our introduction over here. I like to use a pen. If it disturbs you, let me know. Um, but this is where we are. Ellie Wiesel, I love this story, said that modern Jewry is like a messenger who's on his way to fulfill his mission and gets hit on the head and is knocked out. When he comes around, he doesn't remember who sent him, where he was going, what his mission is, and even the fact that he is a messenger. Now, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Elie Wiesel. Um, you know, what, what, a, what a comment for a, someone that had lived through the Holocaust, someone who really afterwards devoted his entire life to learning from that expression and trying to make this world a better place. Um, and when he looked at the Jewish people, this is what he had to say. So imagine 
if this messenger would look around, look through his belongings. Hi, Bertha, you just came on visually. Can you hear us? I can, yeah. Okay, and we can hear you fantastic. Okay. Um, so imagine if this messenger would look through his belongings and come across a little notebook answering all these questions. As he reads it, he would start to recall everything written. He would regain his clarity, reawaken his identity, and revive his passion. So, do we have something like this? That is the question. If someone would stop you on the street, hopefully we'll get back on the street one day, um, and say to you, are you Jewish? You say, yes, indeed, I'm Jewish. And they say, tell me what it means to be a Jew. What would you tell them? Do you have a notebook? Do you have something which kind of clearly defines your identity? Anyone want to take a stab at what you would say? Uh, I would say that uh, I'm supposed to leave the world in a better position than I found it. Nice. Okay. And that's what it means. Now, that's good. Um, anyone else? I would say that it's as a Jew, it's my responsibility to help other people. It's not good of me. It's what I should be doing. It's my responsibility. Uh -huh. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. I think that the community is, um, is really the core of, of Judaism. And it's very important what we do to help each other. Okay, those are all beautiful answers. I would like to suggest that we, that the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments is really a synopsis. It's the clearest and most, um, it's the clearest and most holistic um, answer to this question. You know, everyone has their answer, and I love your answers. Um, the questions I have about them, or let's say to challenge you a little, just to, you know, let's make sure we keep awake here. It's nice to do that. You know, to challenge you a little is, you know, I would ask all of you, what's Jewish about that? Isn't that Christian? Isn't that Muslim? Isn't that humanistic? Isn't, you know, why, why do you have... To, what, 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 what's Jewish about that? Yes, that I understand you're a, 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 a group. And so another question would be, I don't hear God. Where's God in your, in your, um, in, in your, in your notebook? Um, and then the other question is, okay, uh, we're, we're here to make this world a better place, to help people, to be um, involved with the community. What does that mean? How do we go? Are, are there any hows just about, you know, besides what? Are there, are there any hows involved? And I think that's really important because when it comes down to it, and of course that's what we're going to get into here, is people behave really in accordance with their values. And, um, you know, what, what, what we're answering, what, what this question digs at is what really are our underlying values? Not only about what is important, but how we understand the world, the way it works, and therefore able to fulfill those values in a very clear way. So let's see what the Ten Commandments um, have to offer us. That's the journey we're going to go on together. And I, I hope that um, we are going to have a lot of fun and learn a lot together and really get some clarity from these about who we are. Um, interesting. The, we'll, we'll go to the text over here. The Ten Commandments is just 172 words. Now, the most famous American speech of course, was um, the Gettysburg Address. How many words were in the Gettysburg Address? 
You, you get a one high mitzvah point, if you know that. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> I don't remember. Not many. A hundred, not many. A hundred and eighty-two. One eighty-two. The Ten Commandments only has 172. It's very short. It's a very short document. Um, the Ten Commandments are our core values. They explain who we are, what our mission is, and give us guiding principles among which to base our decisions. And here they are. Let's just remind ourselves. Um, um, so I am the Lord. By the way, how's what? What's the general level of Hebrew um, in the, in our group? Mm. No, uh, no. Uh, yeah, I've forgotten a lot more than. I mean. Okay, then I'm not gonna. I'm not yeah. gonna speak. To, it's not gonna help me to speak too much Hebrew, is it? I'm not mm -hmm. gonna help you by okay. use it. But you know, so. I am the Lord your God, number one. Have no other gods. Do not take God's name in vain. Keep Shabbat. Honor your parents. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not be a false witness. Do not covet. Um, that is the Ten Commandments. And that's what we... By the way, that's a synopsis. Obviously, in the, in the Torah, they are, they are much longer. They go up to 172 words. Um, Conversation. Do you have a notebook, something short and simple, containing your core values, the standards of behavior, principles, and beliefs for which you make your decisions? What would these be? I think we discussed that. In what ways does being Jewish impact your core values? Who are we and what is our mission? I think we've covered that. Would anyone like to add anything else? I don't think that we're, you can say that we all think alike or act alike and we behave in a monolithic way. There are a lot of uh, big, deep divide between the Sedum and the different streams of Judaism. Now, I don't think that you can generalize among all Jews and say they all think this or do this. Right. So here's, you know, actually one of the one of the um, reasons why we are why we are passionate about this con this specific conversation about the Ten Commandments is because we are really trying to find something that all go Jews could agree on, and it seems to be the details is where we get um, is where we get caught. So. You know, I don't know of any Jewish group that does not, you know, consider the Ten Commandments um, important, sacred, and I would challenge them to look at them and say, well, you know, do, do they really summarize what you're all about? And um, obviously we'll, we'll know that by the end of this, but that's, that's a great point that you're making, Bertha. It, but it, you know, in terms of, this, you know, you know, that's a good question. Are, are there things you know, that all Jews agree on? Well, probably they, we all agree on the Ten Commandments. So there you go. You know, that's why this is such a, I think there's an opportunity here to, to form a, almost, you know, you, just imagine that the, in terms of Project Deseret, our, our mission or our purpose is to try and influence a united Jewish identity um, to, to bring our people closer together because we really have a, um, a strong belief that we, we are a nation that was formed in a very specific way with a specific mission. And if we could all get around this, you know, get our heads around this and agree to it, we would go a long way to fulfilling that mission. Okay. Um, understanding the Ten Commandments is core values. Core values. Let's let's try a definition over here. Now, um, core values are the most important principles and beliefs we live with. Right. So when the person says, "Well, it's one of my core values," it really means that 
there's some principle or belief that informs how I live, how I make my decisions. They, they form the foundation of our decisions. The way we evaluate situations and our desires are based on them. And as such, they really determine our behavior. It is in this sense that our core values are an essential element of who we are. Where do core values come from? How do we determine them? This question has been asked by the greatest thinkers throughout time with as many conclusions. We will explore how the Ten Commandments ca can form the core values of the Jewish people. So there's a beginning to that. Um, there's a beautiful um, midrash. Are you, are you familiar with uh, what midrash is? Like a story. Yeah. A story, right. So it, it's, it's actually a compilation of many different books. There are many different midrashim. Each book is, is one midrash. And they generally accompany some of the Bible, some of the written Torah. So there's a midrash on the actual five books of Moses. There's also a midrash on most of the books of the, of the prophets and the writings. Um, so, um, and they generally do, con they, we know them as containing stories. A lot of them contain also different halachic statements or um, additional kind of um, either background information or conclusions based on the verses. So um, there's a book called Orgadalia, and he says like this, um, each, and this is based on something called the, we didn't translate this word, the Mechilta. Mechilta is one of the best known, uh, famous um, um, Midrashim. Each Tiber, oh, okay, so we're going to learn two Hebrew words. All right, the first one is Diber. Diber means, we're going to see later, but it refers to one of the Ten Commandments. They're called the Aseret Hadibrot. That's why um, Aseret means ten, Dibrot means commandments. And that's why the program is called Project Aseret, Aseret as in the ten. Um, so each Diber was engraved in the souls of the Jewish people. And from there, they were engraved in the tablets because the Dibrot were actually alive and became the essential life force of the Jewish people. So it seems from what he's saying is that these are not something exterior, right? You know, it's almost God spoke them. They went into the people first, and then from there, they went on to the, oh, there they are, the tablets. Um, how do you think the Ten Commandments and the values they include have affected Jewish and non-Jewish thinking throughout history? Or does, do you resonate with this idea that the Ten Commandments are essential as part of our experience? Not only did we leave Egypt, but we received these Ten Commandments at Sinai, that they influenced us in a very deep way as to who we are. Well, I think they established a moral basis, um, the, the last five anyway, <clears throat> for conducting yourself amongst people. And the first ones uh, established how we were to deal um, with a God. Right. Yeah, so I think so. Great. Okay. Um, Let's go on. Um, now, this is very interesting. Mass prophecy. At Sinai, we collectively heard the Ten Commandments directly from God. It is the only time in history that God spoke directly to an entire nation. Now, this is a fascinating point, not only because it's, it's, it's fascinating in itself. Um, you know, Christianity... Islam, they claim prophecy 
but just like we claim the prophecy to Moses, but no one claims a, a, a clear prophecy to the entire nation besides the Jewish people. And the Ralbag, um, you know, at the, at the um, back of these booklets, by the way, if you'd like a, a digital copy of this booklet, you can get one. I'll make sure you get them. Um, available on our website, no cost. Yeah, we have we have them. Rena and I are doing a class with Audrey as our facilitator. Oh, oh okay, great. So um, here we go. We have a who's who in the text, and over here it explains who this Ralbag was. Um, the Ralbag, of course, an acronym. Rabbi Levi Ben Gershon, and he's pretty old, twelve eighty eight to thirteen forty four, French was a medieval French Jewish philosopher, Talmudist, mathematician, physician, and astronomer, astrologer. We think we can multitask? Well, they, <laughs> look what they were able to do. Um, so what does he write? Let's, let's see what he writes over here. Um, let the screen a little quicker. Um, so he writes the following. Um, okay, you should know that the Sarat Devarim, that's what they are, we, we'll, we'll get more to that in the, why they call Devarim in the Torah. The Sarat Devarim, the Ten Commandments, contain all the mitzvot of the Torah. These are holistic and they're meant to capture the whole Torah. God's intention was that the Jewish people should hear them in a supernatural way directly from himself and not from Moses in order that there would be no doubt that they are from God. So this is the only time God spoke to an entire nation as, as mass prophecy. What are the implications that everyone received the Ten Commandments directly from God as opposed to Moses alone? What does that mean to you? Well, there was no intermediary. It was strictly the word of God. And, and it's almost like we should take it more seriously because it was direct and not somebody telling us what could have possibly been their interpretation. Right. I think that very much is in line with, the, with what the Ral Bug is saying. Right? Leave no doubt. Don't we? These must be crystal clear. Anyone else? Well, it's more important if it comes straight from God, just like um, Bonnie said, instead of through an intermediary and a human okay. one in that. And and how how does that importance? What what would you say? How does that importance um, express itself? I think uh, it's more to be taken internally so that it becomes part and parcel of your being. It's not something you have to look at and read, but it's you. It's, it's internal. Wow. Okay. You know, the, the, uh, the uh, founder of this program that I work with, Rabbi Shalom Schwartz, that, that's his whole thing. He, he, he would be like jumping up and down. Happy that you said that, um, because um, you know, we're, 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 we're a bit, I would say I'm a bit more rationally inclined and he's a bit more mystically inclined. And um, I'm not sure that makes a great difference here, but yes, um, it's almost like, wait, I heard, you know, this was a personal, something I heard personally. The rest, I can go find out. I can go, you know, maybe it's more instructions, maybe more, more advice, but it's not me. This is me. Um, yeah, I love that. I think I have the assumption that these values were not generally practiced by the people at that time. That all of this was new, and this was a different way of behaving than was generally in existence at the time at this time that's just that's my assumption 
if these things were in place, then there would be no reason for God to put forth these Ten Commandments. Um, They'd already be going on. They'd already be in existence. Right. So, you know, I... That's a really interesting comment, and I think opens up a whole conversation. Um, my thinking on that, you know, especially let's go back and just look at them. Um, you know, so obviously I'm the Lord your God, and it finishes who took you out of the land of Egypt. Obviously that was new, that it just happened. Have no other gods, that definitely was something unique. Um, there was, especially coming from Egypt, which was an idolatrous nation. Um, do not take God's name in vain. So I, I wonder if that was a novel idea for those times. Um, Shabbat, for sure, must have been, you know, taking of a day, a day, a day's rest every week at the same time with a spiritual, some sort of spiritual meaning behind it, I'm sure was new. Honor your parents. Um, is that universal? And has that been around forever? I think that's an interesting question. I don't know. Unfortunately, both I can't get, I'm, I, I can't really educate us because I, I don't know that much about the rest of world history, what was happening. I, I question that one. Do not murder, I imagine, was universal. Um, it could be something like child sacrifice might have been prevalent, and this would come to speak to that specifically. Do not commit adultery. Um, is that universal? Um, no. No? They had all these, I think, they had all these sexual um, quasi-religious rights. Right. So that's interesting. Okay. So maybe that was novel. Um, do not steal, I imagine, was, um, was universal, right? I, I imagine, although it could be that people higher up on the hierarchy of life, you know, the pharaoh, whatever, he had kind of rights on people's property. Um, do not be a false witness. I would imagine that one's pretty universal. And do not covet. Um, I suppose the most interesting of them all, um, you know, what's it even doing here? Um, but I would imagine that's also quite, you know, um, I don't know. I don't know about that. So it, definitely there are some which are, of course, very obviously novel. The others I question. Um, perhaps, even if it was what people knew, we know that throughout history, values change. And maybe the fact that God came to us and spoke to us, and we know, well, hang on a second, God's not about to change. If these are God's basic principles, so then these are ones which go throughout time which cannot change throughout time. So maybe it had that force to it. Um, that, that's why we needed to um, receive it. Okay. Um, okay. Now, the, um, the Avodata Kodesh, that's Rabbi Meir Ben, Yechezkel Ibn Gabai gives a graphic expression of this idea as a tree trunk from which the, all the branches, which from, from which all branches spread out. Um, the Barbanel says that the Sarita de Brot are categories for all the 613 mitzvot. Uh, are, you, are you familiar with this term, the 613 mitzvot? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, how, what's the relationship between the Ten Commandments and the 613 mitzvot? So he says they are the ten categories. They are general principles which emerge from them. Um, and they are the roots and foundations for all the 613 mitzvot, which are branches that spread outward. So here we have our two tablets. 
and from there you know comes the tree with all its details um the heart gives life to the body the kuzari he was rabbi yehuda alevi provides another image of the heart which gives life to the entire body he includes the fact that the tablets were kept in the ark the serata dibrit are the root of wisdom placed in the ark which is on the level of the heart which was which flows from it the book of torah was put that which flows from it is the book of torah which was put on the side now according to the Tal talmud what shape did the ten what shape were the tablets the tablets of stone uh, like that <laughs> Or like Nina's beautiful image here. Yeah, so according to the Talmud, they were square. Right? There were two square blocks. However, they have always been, as far as I know, they've always been graphically displayed with that heart image on the top. Right? And that's because of this. That's because the the um the heart is that which is central right the heart the heart is that which gives life to the rest of the body and therefore symbolically they were put into the the heart shape to show us that they played this vital uh role in the jewish system of thought okay um now here we go astonishingly the ten commandments is an incorrect translation and a significant mistake is that in the torah the ten commandments are called aseret hadavarim yeah there's the hebrew aseret ten hadavarim the correct translation is the ten statements a deber or utterances a devar which is a singular, a statement means something general and encompassing of many details. The Ten Commandments should really be translated as the Ten Principles or the Ten Core Values. For this reason, we refer to the Ten Commandments as Debrot in the plural, and when we refer to each specific one, we call it a Deber. So we have Aseret and then Debrot, the Ten commandments um which are really statements now obviously the reason why we use the word commandment is because that's a christian translation right it's probably from the king james king james's bible and um that's how we have it and it's very hard to change our thinking about it but i will try to use this this term pen the serata de brot and de bear um he says over here, the Kitab of Kabbalah, he, he, he says the Ten Commandments are not Ten Commandments. Even though they are commandments, don't fit, right? God, it's a commandment, do not steal. But they're called the Baran because of their term, Deber, as the Rambam says, the highest generality, including all aspects and manners. So if they were called Mitzvot, it would just mean a specific Mitzvot. Now, um, if we looked at the Sarita Debrot, how many mitzvot, how many commandments do you think there are included in them? Take a, take a guess. Is it just 10? No, there are many, there are definitely more than 10. There, there are many of the, the, the Rambam Maimonides, Nachmonides did this exercise of trying to codify the 613 mitzvot. And within the, what we call the Ten Commandments, the Sereti Debrot, they found either 14 or 15 mitzvot commandments. So it really is a very bad translation. Um, okay, what is the difference between a Deber and a mitzvah? So uh, I think we've discussed that. Um, Think of a core value in your life. How does it express it? How do you express it in your actions? And, and the 
I think there's more, more than what's interesting about the question is to realize that, oh, okay, you know, I, I, honesty is important to me. Um, how does that express it in your actions? Well, it means to me when I speak, I should be careful that everything I say is true. It means when I give my word to do something, I should fulfill it. That's also honesty. And the idea is that a core value has many different expressions. And that's the idea that from these 10, we can go to the 613. Um, and really that's a lot about this adventure is how does it, how do they work? How is, what does do not murder mean as a core value that would contain a tenth of the entire Torah of all these 613 mitzvot. Um, okay. Now, contract or covenant? Um, the reason why we're going to go into this is because the Ten Commandments play this role of covenant. As the verse says in Deuteronomy, he, God, declared to you the covenant that he commanded you to observe the ten, the Sarita Dibrat, the ten statements, and he inscribed them on the two tablets of stone. A covenant is a give and take where each party is interested, sorry, a contract is a give and take where each party is interested in their own benefit. Whereas a covenant is the coming together of two or more parties in order to create something for the benefit of the other, or better yet, the whole. It is a merging of identities from the I to the we. So these Ten Commandments, is really these asserted they brought, are called the covenant. The, in Hebrew, Brit, right? B'nai Brit really means the children of the covenant. Which covenant? This covenant. Um, does let's look at some questions here. Does the idea of the covenant of the Ten Commandments explain the Jewish mission? Does the idea of that the command the covenant of the Ten Commandments explains the Jewish mission resonate with you? Which relationships with people in your life would you consider covenantal? Which would be contractual? How does this distinguish distinction inform your actions? And in what ways is this is this distinction reflected in our world? today. Any comments? So it's a covenant more like a marriage or the way a marriage should be? Really? Exactly. Exactly. And in fact, when we when we talk about do not commit adultery, we will explore that. How do you think in our world of individualism, in our world where of you know individual autonomy, this idea works? Does this challenge that? Is that harder for people that grew up and think in a very individual way? I think uh, you can almost think of um, a government should be covenantal um, because it should be a body that's coming together with the people that it's supposed to be helping and that uh, it's for the benefit of both. And we can look at today's events with the coronavirus and people who should be um, isolating themselves and uh, some of them erroneously think that it's to their benefit to go out and uh, object to this. And I think if they thought of it as their uh, government being covenantal, it would be better than contractual because um, oh, yeah. it would be a general 
help as opposed to just one in another. Yeah, I, that, that, I think that's a brilliant um, example of, you know, if not a, not only the way they would think about the covenant, if they would think about themselves as, I have a covenantal relationship with my country. I think a citizen is part, you know, I, I pledge allegiance. I mean, it, it really is part of my identity. And in terms of the covenant, it's the whole that always matters and not the individual. And if, I, you know, we just had Pesach and we, I don't know how you guys experienced your, your Seder, but, you know, when we go through the, the four sons and we ask about the wicked son, and the wicked son is really the one that excludes himself from the community. And we say to him, you know, this is a covenant. Really, that's the answer. That's the dynamic of that wicked son and the answer we give him is, no, you, you, as a Jew, you're in a covenant. It's bigger than you. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's I, I think that's quite challenging for, for today in the world and the values that we live with. Um, okay, and I look forward to discussing that more when we get to do not commit adultery. Okay. Um, let's try and, and get into how we are going to discuss this. Uh, how are we going to approach each Tiber, each of the Ten Commandments, and see them as this general principle, core values for, Ju for Judaism? So we're going to, when we explore each one, we're going to explore the literal meaning. In Hebrew, it's called the Peshat. And that really means do not steal, means do not steal, right? Do not, here we go, do not murder, means do not kill a person unjustly. But then, we, for each one, and that's really where um, I think it, this is, um, the, you know, the meat of this program, is the yesod. The yesod in Hebrew means that means um, foundation, and it it means the underlying meaning. So each commandment are the right underlying each commandment are the principles on which they are based. Principles like are fundamental truths of belief that describe our reality. Be, this is where we find the generality of them. They can, in, they can guide many instructions and decisions. And um, in Hebrew, this level is known as your sod or foundation. So it is on this level that the Ten Commandments are applicable to day-to-day, minute-to-minute living. In order to live with them in this way, each principle of belief must be transformed into a guideline for making decisions. So we're going to do a quick exercise about this. Um, here we go. So um, if we think about do not murder, and of course we're going to discuss this in length when we get to the actual debate that speaks about that. Um, do not kill a person unjustly. However, underlying the principle, the yesod, the underlying meaning, is that every person is created in the image of God. One must respect, protect, and enhance life. As a guideline for making decisions, it's to nurture your own and others' physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual lives. In short, nurture life. So that's really the core value of do not murder is nurture life. Let, let's try um, three more. But would anyone like to try, you know, um, do not commit adultery? What do you think the underlying um, the underlying meaning of this is understanding of it? Of respecting your spouse. Great, right? Do you think it can apply outside of marriage? Can you take that principle and and um, apply it outside of marriage? Not sure. How about other relationships that you're in? 
does the respect you have for your spouse is a respect for maybe the um, relationship that you have. You, you acknowledge the relationship. So maybe we could take that and spread that to other relationships and acknowledge them and respect the people that we are involved in their relationships. Um, when we dis when we go into it, we are going to discuss something called loyalty, right? Um, that's something which is definitely fundamental to marriage, but something that is equally true in all our relationships. Um, anyone want to try another one? How about... Um, do not covet. Do not covet, okay. What do you think? What is underlying that? Be happy with what you have. Right. Right, right. excellent, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's how... No, so before, if I, you know, if I would have said to you, how important in Judaism... You know, this whole construct of Judaism is do not, you know, coveting. You'd say, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. But when you look at it as a one of the core, as one of the Ten Commandments, and, and, and we're kind of forced to say, well, because it's there, it must have this great importance. So it must be that this great importance is, it is in the fact that it's, the message we're meant to take from it, this underlying meaning that we we should be grateful, happy with what we have. And you know, it's actually going to be the first one that we are going to explore. Um, okay, so we're going to uh, leave off today with these everyday questions. And that is things to contemplate. How do you how do you use your core values? Examine decisions you make each day, both large and small. What part do your core values play in these decisions? Keep a journal for a week or more and look back and see which themes emerge. What resonates with you the most? And I think for me, it's, it's important to, sometimes I do things which I think are, beneath my core values and i'm not aligned to them and there's a certain feeling i have when i do that and it's useful even from that point of view to stop and say well what am i doing now that is going against who i am about what i value um think about your jewish bucket list meaning um what are the things you would like to learn yourself what are the social project, social um, um, benefit projects that you're involved with? And choose individual projects for study, social action, and spirituality that reflect your unique uh, principles. And that's something which, um, if you're already doing it, great. If you're not, I'm actually going to suggest that you discuss this with Nina. Um, hi, Nina. Um, thank you for volunteering. And um, that's really a, a very beautiful part of doing a Chaim Mitzvah course is that besides us getting together to study, you also have your own individual study. You know, is there something you would like to learn? Social action, right? That even reflects it on what we've learned tonight. And um, some spirituality that reflects your unique principle. Um, that, that, that's some ritual that you would like to enhance. Okay, over here there's some supplemental materials, and at the end, as we know, there are um, the who's who in our document. Um, and then at the end, um, there's a bit of a... Um, Personal reflections, what choices have you made for your independent study? You can write those down here and take a record. In what ways do your choices reflect your personal core values? 
And um, that's it for tonight. Now, I, I want to ask you all a question. Um, this was set up really for monthly learning. Um, as one, a friend of mine says, we no longer have even weeks. We just have yesterday, today, and tomorrow um, with, all right, with coronavirus. Would you like to keep it to monthly or would you like to do it weekly? I, I think uh, monthly, the way you know we're doing it, the way we had been doing it, um, I mean, that, that just works for me personally. Okay. Yeah. Rina, Bertha? Yeah, I think it would work for me as well. I, I think weekly would be better for me. I'm taking a class at our, um, our Jewish Community Center is offering um, courses for adult Jewish, you know, Jewish courses. And each month there's a different module. And right now we're studying where is God, who is, what is God. And, and we meet um, remotely on Monday nights. So I would like to do it weekly. Plus I'm having difficulty with the isolation and I'm living, I live by myself. So it would be good for me to engage with other people on a weekly right. basis and not monthly. That, that would okay. be Okay, so I, I tell you what, I, I appreciate that, thank you. Um, I think I'll discuss it with Nina. There, there are about five other people that registered for the course. Um, we're not quite sure where they are, but when we get in touch with them, you know, maybe we'll get some feedback from them and then we will let you know how we go. Just a, a question to, to uh, Bonnie and Rena. If we decided to go weekly, would that disturb you? Would that, or it's just a preference? Um, um, it's, it's a it's, preference for me. Yeah, it's a preference. I would just have mm -hmm. to see because we're, um, we're actually just got an email that we're gonna be meeting with Audrey in a couple of weeks for our usual right, class. Right. So I don't know if I'd want to do, you know, personally two in, in one week, just, right. you know, might be a little much. Okay, and we could maybe work that out that we don't do two in one. Other things that you could do with Chai Mitzvah too. So I understand the whole thing with the isolation. There's lots more stuff that we can do to stay connected so you're not uh, isolated because a lot of people feel what you're feeling. It's a very difficult thing. Well, I'll do whatever the group wants to do. I'm not, this is my first um, ex experience with your group. My daughter um, had done this through her synagogue and she sent it to me, but I'm not, I haven't been studying with you all before. So I'll, I'm gonna do whatever you all wanna do. Okay. 